I'll just give a few seconds to let everybody get in. Oh, there we go. Hey, Pig Kick. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the How to Control Minds Ask Me Anything. If you fill up the comments section, I will answer the questions that you're asking me in there. We've had a host of questions on YouTube, a host of questions on Instagram, a host of questions on all formats of social media. And I'm going to be letting the team fire random questions at me and I'll be answering those in a haphazard method manner so if you want to get going somebody from the team fire me a question and i'll start answering them out of the gate just waiting for a question to come in and then we'll uh we'll start to answer them Haley, how's it going pig cake matthew nice to see you instagram submission why is this a kit at all do you know questions like this are I feel controversial questions because the answer that I'm about to give is a relatively controversial controversial answer. The thing that you find in this community is that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you just put a download out, you get one party of people screaming from the rooftops about the fact that this is just a download, it's instantly piratable, and they start giving you shit on the forums for putting it out as a download. And then if you put a kit out, you've got a camp of people that are whinging about the fact that it's a kit. And when we were creating this, I said that I wanted $99 as a download. It were initially going to be a download. So for the same $99 in the Kickstarter, you're getting a kit. So I don't understand why anybody's whinging about the fact that they're getting a free box, they're getting a free book, they're getting free dice. That There's a multiple effects with a dice and a small download that comes, that utilizes the dice, a, a hypnosis effect that uses the pen. And when I get into what it's all about later on anyway, I'm sure more people understand, but I'm sure that if you give people a choice between having something for $99, it's just a download on $99, you get the kit, the box and everything else. Most people would choose the kit anyway. So you're getting free stuff for the same money. So I don't understand the question. It's a ridiculous question. I'd prefer to have something in my office on a shelf, something that's tangible, I could touch, that I can go out and use in performance. The brass pen is part of one of the routines. There's a full documentary that's on the set. And I like little things like the USB sticks and the USB keys. And it's a great place to have it because I seem to remember that when, when the Back to Black fiasco went on, everybody were crying about the fact that they didn't think the downloads were safe and they were wondering that, are they in a hub somewhere? Well, now you've got your own little private hub that you can keep them in and it doesn't make a difference whether it comes off the website or not. So I just think it's a ridiculous question. And I hope that doesn't offend anybody who were wondering about that. But the honesty is that why is it a kit? Because I decided that I wanted it to be a kit and that's why it's a kit and it's not your product. You know, so if you, you want to release a download, then you release a download, but I wanted to release a kit. So here we go, Frank. Hey, Pete, for someone that's been studying this stuff for a while, like me, would you say that to the guys on the fence about it and if they'll learn anything from it? Do you know what? Just last week, I were in the jam session uh, with Mark Lemon, and I've studied this stuff since I'd go back. I was using some of these techniques when I was 15 years old. So, you know, I, I didn't have a point of reference of traditional learning like most people. So I were creating these effects to replicate the things I was seeing hypnotists do, Darren Brown do, and other people. And that really shaped the way that I perform now and the way that I think now and the direction that I take my routining in. And I've had a lot of years to refine them. And just last week, within the space of three days, I said to Mark, you know, when I was sat next to Mark on the, on the jam session, I said, you know what? I said, I've learned so much over the last three days. And he turned to me and said, you know, I've learned the same. So if we've been doing this stuff for, you know, years and years and years. And we were both learning by jamming and creating new things. We must have come up with about another 15, 16 ideas. I mean, don't quote me on the exact number, but a lot of ideas on that jam session, things that we never knew about. And to give you an example of one of them, you know, imagine somebody sat across a table and they're asking the spectator questions. And whilst the spectator's eyes are closed, you can turn an imaginary dial down in somebody's head and they can no longer hear the person sat across from them and they can't answer the questions. But when you turn the dial back up, they can answer the questions. So you're muting the sound of people around you. Ways to make somebody speak a completely different language and, and other things like that, all using specific techniques that we'd use in our act for years and years and years, you know, hypnotically stopping somebody from being able to see that a clock's working whilst the rest of the audience can. And they're claiming, look, I felt the movement stop. It's not moving and everybody else is seeing that it moves. There's a lot of effects that we didn't think were going to make it, you know, like where we didn't know about, we've not ever talked about because we not created them until last week. And that was just the jam session. And then they added 
bit of you know Midas touch, which just takes it to the next level. It doesn't matter if you're on the fence or not. My recommend, listen, if I sit here and say get it, you're going to think it's just because I'm biased, and I am biased because it's my product. But I'm telling you as somebody honestly, if I if you know me and you've known me long enough, Frank, to know that if I thought that you were going to get better value somewhere else, I'd say to you, you know, get something else. But the honesty is, if you're asking and you're on the fence there'll be a lot that you'll learn from it because there's a lot of nuances and subtleties and new creations and things that happened along the way, situations that presented themselves that we didn't expect to happen. Do you know what I mean? And you get to see how to work around those things. And and the documentary itself, which again, we'll get into later on, the documentary itself has got so many beautiful little things in it that beginner or pro, you're going to walk away from this with something. Do you know what I mean? And so I hope that answers your question. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Um, so it's a, it's a great question. So Chris, just an insight for other people. I had the best time in the world with Chris. I were, in, I were over in California and I, I were working on a television show in California. At the time, I'd just gone to Run Pink Studio and I think I maybe mentioned this yesterday. I'm not sure. I did a, I did a show yesterday, maybe I mentioned this to, to somebody I did an interview with. And I went to Run Pink Studio and I got to jam with the Foo Fighters at Run Pink Studio, hung out with Brandon Queen, working with Kayla Morelli on a few bits and jamming backwards and forwards with him. What a guy. And then jumped on a plane from there, flew over to Sacramento. I hung out with Chris Oberle and Chris Ramsey and we just had a hell of a time. So it's lovely to see you on here. Um, the effect I'm most proud of, do you know what? Every single creation that's on the set is a small peak, a mind the pun inside my mind at the way I think about creating and routining. And it's difficult to pick one of them. It's like without sound, I don't want to sound like I'm being egotistical when I say this, but for me, it's like a great album, you know, like this angle comes up uh, and then on the angle uh, album, you're so proud of a lot of the things that are on there. It's hard to choose one. I really love my das touch because my das touch is something that I actually use all the time. It's like if I go out and I've got nothing on me, I'll use it. The new touches on it just make it incredible. You've all seen the reactions on the trailer. Um, I really love friction. Now friction for me were always a little throwaway thing. It, it, you know, it wasn't one of those things where you'd sit back and you'd go, wow, like, and then, I started performing it for the skeptics, right? And I suddenly realized that this is just as powerful as the other things that are on the set. And all of a sudden, it worked its way up into my favorites as well. And I've used this stuff for years, like I say. But every single time I've come back to re-performing stuff that I've not performed for maybe five years, eight years, whatever, and I've brought them back, I've just re-fallen back in love with them. So <clears throat> to answer your question, is there anything you attempted to keep to yourself instead of releasing? I actually only release about 2% of what it is that I, I create to the community. I mean, this is just, this were a note that I created just yesterday. So this is or just a couple of days ago. So this is, so here, I mean, I don't know if you can see this on camera. I don't know if the camera will pick it up, uh, but I'm always creating and I bash my fingers. So you'll have to excuse that. I bashed it with a hammer. Um, but I'm always, I'm always creating all the time, every single day. So what you guys actually see is really only 1% or 2% of the things that I'm comfortable sharing. And the rest I keep for me, you know, I don't, I, I don't do this. I don't do it for the money. And that's another thing I want to point out whilst I'm on with you, Chris, you know, so it made me laugh. I, I read in the comments, oh, he's sold out for a bag of money or, do you know, I don't actually, just for everybody watching this, let me categorically state on the record. And I don't care if I'm not allowed to talk about this illusionist, you know me, I talk about what I want. I don't get paid any extra by illusionist for doing this product. So when I do a deck of cards, I get a salary. I get the same salary every single month. If I release a deck of cards, a $10 download, this kit, I get the same salary. I don't get an extra bonus on top. I'm not getting an extra wage. Illusionist have been so good to me through the 16 months that we were locked down in COVID. Everything's been quiet and we've been coasting through. We've been, you know, we've been moving forwards. And I were taught when I worked in a factory, I used to work in a factory when I was younger. If it's quiet, pick up a fucking broom and sweep the floor. And so what I've done is I've metaphorically picked up a broom and I've done the best damn sweeping that I can do. So for all those people that think that this is for a bag of money or that think I'm being paid any extra, I'm not. But do you know what the most offensive thing is? The most offensive thing is, is when you post shit like that, because I'm doing this to give back to you guys. Inadvertently, illusionists obviously make money from it. I don't make any extra money, but I just want to produce quality content for you. 
And then when I read your comments that I'm just doing this for the money and have you seen the car that he drives? I think it's an absolute kick in the nutsack when I'm doing my best for you. You cry that you want quality content at Illusion. I bring you quality content and you say he's only doing it for the money, which is an absolute fabrication. So that can stop on social media because that's not true either. Um, I don't mind you posting other things about me. If you want to say it looks like a kid's drawn on my face with a Sharpie, that's potentially true. There's, you know, there's some truth in that. You could say my tattoos are bad. There's some truth in that. What I won't have is I won't have people posting out and out lies about me because that's not fair. And lies are damaging to people's career, you know. So, Tajad, I hope I pronounced that right. I want to say thank you for all the work and for the incredible kit you're bringing to us. Thank you for following my story. The honesty is, I know sometimes it seems like, there you go, you know, Midas Touch, $99 is the price for Midas Touch alone. There's more than 10 effects. You're getting more than 10 effects. The dice that comes in the kit, you're also getting effects that come with the dice and a small standalone download with that, an effect that comes with a pen, you know, loads and loads of routines, touches, subtleties for billet work, for gorilla style billet works, my work on the center tear, switches, peaks, how to segue into this information, how to make this work in a situation when you've got a skeptic, how to do this if you have no billets, no nothing, if you've never touched a billet before, you know. Um, and Mike said, will it not be sold separately? It, it will be sold separately, Mike. And the reason being is that when we put, when I put it onto the set and the honest, and this is, the honesty is it, it came out and it was something that I'd kept for myself for a long time and I'd used it for myself. And I started watching the trailer back and I started watching the videos back and I just got talking and it just came out. And it, after it come out, you know, I could have removed it from the footage, but I just thought to myself, you know, I'm going to keep it in there in the interest of everybody that's believed in me and followed me. And that's why I wanted to share it. But just to jump back to what I was saying, you know, Chris, like I'm, I keep a lot of stuff back. I keep a lot of uh, material back for me. And it's only when the time's right. And I really felt that, you know, this stuff now, I want to shed it and I want to move on. I want to become better. I want to grow and I want to get to the next level level in the, the ladder of my own career. And the only way to do that is to share it with you guys and then see what you guys do with it. Because then when I watch your videos, you inspire me and then I grow, we grow, we're all students for life. And so I know sometimes I seem a little bit angry and I seem like I go off on like tangents about things, but I just don't like people lying. Say what you want. You could call me what you want. Just don't lie. I think it's unfair. And I think it gives it gives whoever it is that's doing it an unfair advantage to spread these nasty lies without me having a voice to, to back it up. And I don't have the time to go through all social media to find these things. But, you know, in the words of Kelly Jones, it only takes one tree to make a thousand matches but it only takes one match to burn a thousand trees. It doesn't matter how much good work I do and how much goodness I put into this stuff. It only takes one fabrication or one lie to destroy, destroy that for everybody else. And that's not fair. So let's have a look. Hey Lee, how's it going? Good to see you as usual. My question is, would you tell a budding magician about how to incorporate this into his or her routine? Um, it does go into that on the set. The problem is that I think a lot of magic and mentalism and pseudo hypnosis and hypnosis it really pushes the way that you're supposed to do something down the throat of the person that's watching it. And anybody that's already a budding magician, you're sharing with them the tools. So there's a, there's a saying, you know, if you, if you fish for a man and you get him a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach him to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. And what I'm doing here is, yeah, I do give you some tips and insights into how I would incorporate it into a set. And I say, by no means, you do you have to do it that way, but I'm giving you the tools. And I'm teaching you the tools to be able to do this. And so, you know, it's more about giving you the techniques, the tools, the insights, showing you where it is that these routines have had in the past potential pitfalls so you don't have to encounter those pitfalls. And the br true brilliance with this set, and let me just, it's not related really to this question, but it's for anybody that's worried about this. And this might be a question that comes up so we can eliminate it from the list. When you fail at magic, so let's say you've got an invisible deck or a gimmick and you fail in front of people and you flash the gimmick, everybody from that point knows that every time they see another magician do this, that you failed and that they're doing the same trick, they're using a gimmick and whatever else. If you were using a Svengali deck and they say, hey, let me have a look at that, and they pull it apart and they look at the Svengali deck, you're rumbled. And the true brilliance with this stuff, let's say that you do something wrong it all starts to go to shit and things start to fall to pieces. You have a brilliant escape plan that you don't get in any other industry. You don't get it in mentalism. You don't get it in magic. And it's this. 
in hypnosis, the audience are already conditioned to understand that it doesn't work on everybody. So your escape, if you ever feel anything's going wrong, is just to say, you know, you're just one of the people that are not suggestible. And nobody's going to think you're a bad hypnotist. Nobody's going to think you're a bad performer. And it's your beautiful get out of jail free card in these routines. So you never have to worry about failing. So all I give you all the tools, tips, subtleties, and techniques and recommendations for how I do this, I teach you how to use those tools to incorporate into your act. So I hope that, that sort of makes sense. I'm very excited about the Diceman angle. Can you take it? You taking a performance tap? Can you elaborate more? Yes. So I were at Mark. I, I don't know if I were at Blackpool or I were at Mark Lemon's house. I can't remember where we were, but Mark told me this story about the Diceman. And for those people that don't know what the Diceman is, the Diceman's a book about a guy that decides to live his life based on the role of a dice. And it was such a craze, maybe in the 70s and 80s, I could give you the exact dates, that people like Richard Branson and celebrities started doing it. And Richard Branson come forwards and said that it was so dangerous, he only managed to last 24 hours. And I read that statement and I read the book and then I thought, oh, this is incredible. And then didn't talk about it for about 10 years. And then Mark messaged me and said, are you done with my Dice Man book? And I'm like, what do you mean am I done with your Dice Man book? He's like, are you done with the book? And I went through the books that I had in the house and I found it. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read this one more time. So I sat and read it one more time and I looked at it from a new perspective and I could appreciate it from a new perspective. And obviously the last 16 months have been monotonous for most of us. You know, going through constant cycles, a lockdown, being allowed out for a week, lockdown, being told what to do, where to stand, distance and everything else that we've been living in this box. And it almost felt for like 16 months that my entire life were just so restricted and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to live as the dice man, let other people make decisions, roll the dice, and just whatever the dice says, whether it's going against the grain, it's going against this, do it. And I took the, the concept to Illusionist and said, this is what I want to do. Because they initially wanted me to do the How to Read Minds 2 kit. And I got the props in, I had a look at the props. And looking at the props, the props are incredible. We, you know, we'd managed to get the prototype, so they want the finished ones. And they said, right, you know, when do you want to start work on the How to Read Minds 2 kit? And I said, not yet. I said, like, I want to have six months a year messing with these props so I can take the absolute best of the best, get the most out of them, and really pick them apart so people can get the most out of the kit instead of just going and doing it. And they said, yeah, that's fine. And they were like, you just go and rehearse it. Now, to them, they were going to give me that six months or that year to go away and rehearse it. And, and I sat there and thought, you know what? Like, I don't want to sit here for 12 months doing nothing, and this, this concept's a great concept. So I pushed for it again and said, can we not do, and we, we're going to call it Jedi. I said, can we not do Jedi, but, you know, film a documentary about the dice? And there's been some incredible things that have happened along the journey, you know. The, the, you know, there were some ups and some downs. There were times where I had to do things that I didn't want to do. You know, I had to sleep outside and in my truck. And I had to travel. I, I had to drive from here to get down to the coast, to then go across the Euro Tunnel in my car, to then drive nearly... 17 hours across France to get to the border of Spain, to then drive down into to Salou in Spain and then across to Benidorm maybe, I can't remember exactly, it's on the documentary, and then get a ferry across to Mallorca, then drive through Mallorca over to where the guys were. And they were enjoying beers in a pool and everything else and just waiting for me to get there. And in fact, Dwayne started to shoot with uh, Victor Pineapple whilst he were over there to tie the two things together. And when I got over there, I didn't even have a camera guy. I had to use Mark Lemon. And so Mark and I end up on this little journey and this little trip. And we were deciding what food I were eating. And one night I were in this Italian restaurant. I ended up getting snails, which I absolutely hate. And it was just mad. And it decided what drinks we were drinking, where we were going to perform, what we were going to perform. And and I ended up going back to my roots, to the very first sets of working men's clubs that I ever worked at because we put loads out and we rolled the dice and decided on that. I ended up getting a, an event in London, which I didn't know I was getting. And Silar actually hooked me up with that because it said stage show location London. And we frantically searched Facebook for somebody that could help us out. We, and then we were going to change it to a, like a... a a street show. We were going to do one in Covent Gardens. And then Sila got back to us and said, I can get you in tomorrow night at this place. And I'm like, oh, you're an absolute dude. Turned up, filmed that. Um, so the documentary is going to really take a look at how I started in magic. And there's going to be some un unseen footage of me from when I were a lot younger and some videos. And it's going to talk about my rise and, and the formula I used, which is going to be really helpful for anybody that's wanting to get into this community or this industry. You know, it's going to talk a little bit about the TV shows and how I will be booked. It's got some interviews from other people 
I've also snipped some old footage out of stuff, like interviews with my dad talking about hypnosis four days before he passed away. Um, and then there's interviews from like Kenny who were the first person who put me on and I'm, and I've got new interviews with these people. And then, and then it rolls into the first set of performances, which is at this old working men's club. You know, obviously the dice rolls, we, I talk about the fact that they're out of sequence. They're not sequential. They just fit the narrative of the documentary, but you can see us making the decisions all the way along and the hardships and the, the fun times. And so, yeah, you get to see me performing in all environments. You know, there's a, there's a birthday party thing that, we rolled and that came up and and they're all a lot younger than I am. It were mad going to that. And then there is like the travel all the way through Spain and sleeping in the truck and doing the performances in Spain. And then there's the corporate. We, we filmed a corporate event. We managed to get a, an entertainment company at the last minute to put us on at a paid corporate event. And you get to see me working a corporate event. There's a stage show where there's going to be bits of that cut out. There's a working men's club, as I mentioned. So you see that the hardest of the hardest audiences. And then there's the streets. So you get to see the locations in different places. And then a behind the scenes of what it took to put it all together. So I know that were a long-winded answer to a question, but the the Dice Man were the direction I wanted to take it in, and I wanted to make it a documentary so it was fun and interesting for you to watch because there's nothing worse, for, in my opinion, than a DVD set or a download or a, a USB stick or whatever they are, that when you get it, you watch it, and it's just effect, explanation, effect, explanation. I didn't want that, and I don't want that for my work. You know, I don't want that anymore. Um. So as a follow-up, and hello, my friend, would you say this is a series of effects that requires some true study, or would you say that this is something a read-and-go type of series of effects? So I, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I've said this. I'm going to play a little clip. So I'm going to play a little clip that were filmed that should answer this question. This was sent just yesterday. You know, there's a, sorry, my phone started to play it as I opened it as well. So um, the honesty is that you can get this stuff, and there's a lot of this stuff that you can get out of the box and just go and play you could just go and do it. But this is something that I said, and I hope you can hear this, but this is something that I said to Mark last week in the jam sessions. It says very openly on the box, you can go out there and do this from watching it and just go out and do it straight away. You can, you can. Doesn't necessarily mean that you should. You know, if you, it depends how, if you're just wanting to impress your friends and just have a bit of fun, then certainly do. But if you're a student for life like I am, or you've got this book, then respect it and take the time. So, to... so, the, so the honesty is that, yes, there's effects in there. You know, there's a very simple effect, effect in there that just requires the cross-cut force. And then you can move straight into a piece of hypnosis by putting an induction on the start. And if you've never done this stuff before, you'll be able to instantly do it. So if you're somebody that's a beginner in card magic and you think, you know, I want to give that a go, then you can. Do I think that you're going to be able to watch my Das Touch and go out the very minute you've watched it and be able to perform it? The honest answer is no but you'll be able to do one PK touch and we talk about that. And once you've done one PK touch, you're only needing to add two paragraphs of script to be able to do the entirety of my das touch. Now, if you're going to go out and you're going to do it badly and you're not going to give it the respect it deserves, and well, that's not on me. I talk about on the project at lengths, the respect for the art form. And hopefully people watching this video will understand that, you know, this is something that, this is an industry that's given so much to me and I've got so much time and respect for it that if you buy a Svengali deck at two in the afternoon and you go and perform it at five o'clock in the afternoon, I don't agree with that. I really don't agree that the, 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 you should be doing that. I get effects now and I'll sit on them for a year. But I just mentioned the How to Read Minds 2 kit. I said to the team, I want the props. I want to have them for six months to a year and I want to go out and work them, right? And and that's it. So I want to work them um, because I want to, I want it right. Now, if you're going to be the sort of person that buys these effects to go out and do them straight away, that's okay. Like I said, you've got the most beautiful out in the world. You can't fail. You can't fail at this stuff because you just say, oh, you're not the sort of person that's suggestible. I, I'm i in two frames of mind with this sort of stuff. I've got friends. Like, like I've got friends that I've been friends with for years that have read a lot of things. And I've got, and it's not just one or two friends. It's multiple. And they say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to write a performance. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then it comes to it and they don't have the confidence to do it. And the reason I think that they don't have the confidence to do it is because they've read so much about it and it's now been built into this such, such a big thing that it's going to be so difficult for them to overcome this big thing that they've created. Whereas for beginners, there's no frame of reference of that. So it's very easy for them to go out and not worry about having to, to fail. 
and I, I'm a big believer in when you're learning to swim, just throw somebody in the deep end. Do you know what I mean? And let them go for it. And they never then, I never learned traditionally. I had to, I learned the difficult stuff. I created difficult stuff and then worked my way back through all the traditional stuff. And what this is, this is that middle line. You know, if you're into this stuff or you're not, look at it. If it impresses you, then you're going to want to learn. Do you know what I mean? And I think that to me, there's nothing more powerful than some of the stuff that you'll find on this kit. You know, I'm not not to take anything away from from packet tricks, you know, but for me, the idea of showing four ace of spades and then one of them magically turns itself face down and now the next one turns itself face down and now the third one turns itself face down and before the fourth one's even done, you know it's going to turn itself face down and then you turn them over and the back designs have changed but nobody realises that because they don't remember the colour of the back design from the beginning and the only thing that your audience are left wondering is why are the four ace of spades inside this one packet? It must be a trick deck because I've never seen four aces in one deck before all of a sudden, something like that, to me, isn't as powerful as being able to put somebody's hand onto a table. The biggest skeptic in the room walks up and says, do it to me. And they put the hand down and you stare them right in the eyes and it's a game of psychological warfare. And you stare right into the deepest core of their soul and you stop them from being able to move and speak. And when you snap your fingers, they can start speaking. And that works every time, do you know what I mean? It's not a hit and miss. There's, there's also, for the suggestion-based version, a beautiful out that I built into it so that you're the person that succeeds every time, even if they lift their hand and they think they've won. Even in the suggestion-based version, there's several different versions on the set. Some of them are 100%, but you win and you win every single time. And 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 it's less laboursome to do that than it is to learn an Elmsley count, to learn to have to justify the reason for four ace of spades, to learn to have to keep the back design hidden and the fact that you're using the four ace of spades so that you're hiding the discret. It's just too much intricacy. And so I think that if you want to learn this, that's not taking anything away from people that do that. Do you know what I mean? Like there's ju perfect justifications for it. Do you know what I mean? If you find those justifications. So Stephen, how to read mine changed my life from being a dabbler to a performer. So when how to control minds dropped, I got all the add-ins. I can't wait. Well, Stephen, thank you for being a part of my story and thank you for following me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something now, uh, YouTube comment. Keep that on the screen. because, In fact, drop that down and I'll tell you to bring it back up because I want to just say something for Stephen. Thank you. I want to say something to Stephen. Stephen, I'm going to say something now that's probably going to be clipped out and used in the wrong context. And if it does, you'll see exactly why I hate doing these type of events when people do silly things like this. But I do not like putting things on Kickstarter, but not for the reasons that you might imagine. When I got told that I were going to be part of the team and I were going to work on how to read minds, I came in maybe a quarter away, to, you know, a third of the way through the process. And they'd already designed a lot of the things and I got to see them. And luckily, the things that they'd put in the set, I already had a, a big, great understanding of. And there was stuff that I'd worked on. And so we made certain changes, we changed certain things, and we made it just right. And then when they said it were going out on Kickstarter, I never opposed to it. But I panicked a bit because... Chris Ramsey, Adam Wilbur, Daniel Madison, and Pete McKinnon were on the How to Be a Magician set. And I had to sit there knowing that my creations were going to be stacked up against those four powerhouses. And so on the days up to the Kickstarter, I never said anything. But when it went on there, you know, and everyone starts then just attacking me from all angles without seeing the set, and I'm having to defend myself, I thought, what have I got myself into? And then it surpassed the original kit and I sort of breathed and there's nothing worse than putting yourself on public display like that. There's nothing worse than, you know, putting yourself on public display with the potential air of a flop. Now I really want to thank you guys for taking a chance. And what I mean by that is that this isn't the sort of material that you'd find over at Illusionist. So when I brought the idea of doing this up to Illusionist, they were like, we don't know, you know, we don't know how our audience will respond to it. And I just pressed on, I pressed on and I'm really glad that you've taken a chance on the fact that this is the sort of stuff you want to perform because to me it's heartwarming, you know, and, and I'm always worried when Kickstarter comes up and this has surpassed any of my expectations. So thank you for that. Um, can you bring that comment back up on the screen that you had up? Because I, I did read that. YouTube comment, does a stooge come for free with a kit? What a lovely comment. Whoever posted that, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, these are my favorite type of comments, not because it's a bad comment, when you read that comment, you might think to yourself, this is a bad comment, but you know what? 
Years and years ago, I'd look at someone like this and I'd think, this is the most horrific thing you can say to somebody, but now it's the biggest compliment that you can pay me. And the reason it's the biggest compliment you can pay me is because what you're inadvertently saying is that the scopes of your imagination don't allow you to understand how you could ever perform something like this without an actor. And that means that I've ever I've surpassed any expectation you could ever have. And that means that the stuff that I'm doing and I'm doing easily in teaching people on this set is that incredible that you think I need to carry a pocket of stooges around with me. So it's the most great compliment you could ever give me. And you know what? When I dealt with comments like this, when I first came out, when I was first performing to the industry, I were doing things that the industry had never seen, you know, very first person to ever do a propless name divination and pin code divination, their birthday revelations. And people saying, oh, it must all be stooges. But that quickly got silenced over 10 years of proving myself over and over again at thousands of different events and conventions to hundreds of different people, people selected by the throw of a paper ball or what people nominating other people to be picked. And after a while, what happens is I sat back and thought to myself, do you know what? This entire industry fought for 10, well, five years that I must have used stooges to achieve what I achieved. And I sat there and thought, I've done something right. Because if I'm doing this right and my own peers think that I need to use stooges to do this, then I'm exceeding any of their own expectations for themselves. And if you want to see exceed those expectations as well, all you have to do is do this stuff. Do you know what I mean? So for me, that's a compliment. So thank you for whoever it was that sent that. Magic Nick, I backed the kit before the trailer finished. Well, thank you for that. Do you know what I mean? This is the sort of stuff I love to read because I sit here and I think, I'll tell you something. I am, I'm just a, a guy that were born into a, a rundown, bad, bad look, bad hand background. And I hustled my way through to even get an audience with people to be able to send my first book. And when I sent my first book over it, they said it were horrific and we reworked it and they give me the time of day. I never expected in a million years that I'd be flying around the world. I never expected in a million years that people around the world would ever know I am. I never expected to be the buzz of, of a magic community. And do you know what? I absolutely, I absolutely hand on heart. Really thank you. Cause when I was 12 years old, I picked up Andrew Main's book and I, I said, one day I'll publish a book because I were holding an American's book in my hand and the concept of even traveling from America to England was something that I couldn't even logically comprehend. And I closed my eyes and I went, one day I'm going to do this. And every single one of you that have turned up on this, asked me anything, have made that dream come true. So thank you. Uh, Matt, Pete, you've rocked the AMA so far. Thank you. Can we touch on the legacy collection? So yeah, so the legacy collection is, I always pay homage to everything that is that I do. And so... I mentioned this, I were on, just for people to know, I were on one of Craig Petty's videos last night. So Craig had an interview and I talked to Craig about things and I, I answered his question about the Stack Watch 2 trailer and other questions, but this also directly correlates with your question. There have been certain pinnacle moments along the journey of the last 10 years. So it was, it was 10 years in February since the very first book I ever released and I were working on it two years before that. And obviously years and years before that, I were just performing and other things. And I were a pitchman and a stall at 12 years old. But those pinnacle effects along the journey over 10 years, things that really shaped the way that I think got public interest, got raved about, were talked about, were controversial, it, those effects made it into that legacy collection. So it's a collection of things over 10 years. Now I get asked frequently, is this the same as the masterclass series? And the answer is no. Whilst there are a couple of things from the masterclass series in there, because just coincidentally, there's a crossover. Other routines are not in the masterclass series, but might have been found on a very rare book or just as something I posted on a forum 10 years ago in a little private section that might have been taken down now, or just things that really shaped my journey over 10 years over all aspects and areas of mentalism and, and the honesty is when i got all the effects together i never anticipated grouping them the way that they were grouped i just got the effects that shaped the way that i thought all the way along and inspired me and the little things that i were inspired by and then when i looked at them there were natural groupings of a few effects here and there over the different categories and i thought you know what that's the way that we'll group them and that's what the legacy series is it's, it's to celebrate 10 years of the things that really got me to where I am now. And so the effects that were controversial, the ones that got me my first lectures on the other side of the world, you know, people paid for flights to the other side of the world and accommodation and, and, and bear in mind, 
You know, I'd never seen, I'd never in one place seen what a thousand dollars or a thousand pound looked like in my entire life, right up till about 25 or 26. And I worked three jobs at one point. And so, you know, like I said, I don't do this for the money, but these are the effects that when they flew me out to the other side of the world and they were paying that for the hotel and the flights alone, I was mind blown. And it inspired me to want better for myself and want better for my family and my son. And so I just kept slogging. I kept working as hard as I could. And the legacy collection is a representation of all that, that hard work. Does the kit also work for me if I don't want to learn hypnotize people? Yes. it's Some of the stuff in the set touches on, a, on hypnosis and it touches on the idea of this is hypnosis and here's a quick backdoor into hypnotizing people if you want to, but you've got to approach that stuff with respect. This stuff is not hypnosis. Like I said, it looks like hypnosis. It feels like hypnosis, but it's far more foolproof. It's just a series of pseudo effects that I created so that you can look to people like you're doing hypnosis. And the reason that I learned this, Nevio, is that I was, I was, uh, I used to cover for a hypnotist who was going to make an appearance on the How to Control Minds kit and talk about how I used to cover his shows for him. And there's photographs of us in the past from when we were younger. And he talks about how uh, when he, had a gig or he would double booked, I'd go in and I'd do the hypnosis shows for him. And now when you're working these rooms with 10, 15 people in these little working men's club in the arse end of nowhere, and you can't get anybody under because nobody's suggestible. Or it's just a bunch of people who don't want to come up on stage. You had to learn these effects to kill the hour that you were supposed to be doing hypnosis. So this were actually my working set when I was covering for a paid professional hypnotist. Some of these effects were what I did to get me through that hour, that hour and a half in order to be able to put across the fact that I'd used hypnosis and not one person ever questioned the fact it wasn't hypnosis. And it was actually quite a compliment when I saw hypnotists watching the trailer and saying, oh, this is the type of stuff that we do. And I'm sat there thinking, yeah, it looks like what you do, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? Because they were, they thought it were real hypnosis. They genuinely thought that all that stuff were actual hypno. And that made it even better for me because it's not, it's, it's hypno effects. And there is, it does touch on it. There is a little bit of suggestion in there, but it's not overwhelming. And you can take what you, look, this is the thing, Nevio. You're going to buy this kit. And if I stood here and said, you'll love every single second of everything I said, that'd be a lie. And the reason it'd be a lie is because you're not me. And when you listen to somebody's CD, it's very rare that you find every track is for you. It's the same when you read a book. So you'll, you'll like 90% of it, 95% of it. Even if you only like, 20% of it, that 20% might take you forwards, inspire you and get you gigs and you're using it at gigs and you're making that money back or you, it might be the showstopper at the parties that you're performing at or it, it might be the thing that it takes to get you into certain social situations if you want a party trick. Do you know what I mean, I'm not here to say what context you're performing, but beginner, intermediate, professional, this stuff in here will work for you even if you don't want to learn hypnosis. Just waiting for the next question. There we go. I have the bigger fish files, Devil in Disguise 2 and Jinx, How to Read Minds. Is it still worth picking up this kit? So, Ryan, yeah. So you've got all that stuff. Do you know what? Thank you for following along with this. You'll know uh, the try principle. Uh, there's nothing on Devil in Disguise 2 from this set, I don't believe. And I don't think there's a... Oh, wait a second. Devil in Disguise 2, there is a handstick, but the handstick's different in this set to the one on there. So the one that you've got, there's an, the, there's an actual intricate working that's not in this set. And it's not because I omitted it from this set. It's just because I've learned a quicker way to do it. Uh, there's nothing in Jinx 2 and there's nothing in How to Read Minds that's similar to this other than in How to Read Minds, I do discuss billet peaks. I don't know if there's any crossover in one or two of the billet techniques in the jam session, but the certain difference between this set and How to Read Minds is that in the jam session, we talked about ways if you've not got anything in your pocket to gain information using beer mats to use using makeup pens to finding slips of till roll to using receipts and train tickets and lots of other little things and how you can use those things. So that's certainly not on any of the other sets. Um, the try principle is on the bigger fish files, but there's the jam session with me and Mark last week. Like I said, we came up with so many effects that I'd never even thought about before. And there's one touch that we came up with. Well, I say we, Mark, it was such a brilliant thing Mark come up with that I wish I'd come up with it, um, where he does this thing where he moves the pressure. I can't say any more than that. You have to watch it to see. And it's so brilliant that I wish I'd have thought about it because I'd have been using it 
five years ago, six years ago. So I learned from this set. And I'll tell you what, the jam session alone, I were in a stuffy room in the middle of Wales, not wanting to film. The room were burning me up. The windows wouldn't open. There's a light staring me in the face. I didn't want to be there. The honesty is that I did not want to be there. And then I started the jam session with Mark. And when the camera went off, I thanked Mark profusely. I said, Mark, I said, do you know what? You've made me want to stay for the next two days just to hear what we come up with. And afterwards, Mark said when we were going out into the car park, he were like, you know, thank you for that. And I said, no, I said, no, thank you. Do you know what I mean? The last two days or three days have been epic. So the honest answer is, yeah, it's very much worth picking it up for the jam session alone because the jam session alone could have been taken and used as a product. And I wish, I wish now, uh, am I going to Blackpool next year? The answer is uh, yes. So if you're going to Blackpool, Come and see see us at Blackpool. Come and hang out at Blackpool. But yeah, I wish I wish that I, w- I wish that you know I'd have known all this stuff beforehand because I'd have been using it. But yeah, Blackpool's one of my favourite conventions. I really love the session. I love Blackpool. Um, I I really miss Blackpool. It's been a long time since I've been, so I'd definitely definitely be at Blackpool. And if you see me at Blackpool, come up and say hello. Do you know what I mean? Let's sit down. Let's have a jam. I've the one thing is I've always got five minutes for everybody and it's not just five minutes but i'll sit and i'll happily talk with people you can ask me anything i'm a huge fan of your work hey valco slightly off topic how do you feel about pseudo explanations i'm going to show you something now that i wrote the other day um wait a second i'm just opening it up i wrote the other day a full thing about a pseudo explanation because i because i love I love them when they make sense. You know, that here it is. It's called When It Falls Down. So I don't know if you can see this, but I start to talk in this thing. And again, it's a long, it's a long, long thing. But this is all about pseudo explanations, right? And it, and it says right here, wait a second. Um, I were talking about an anagram and I'm going to get into why this is relevant in a moment. But pseudo explanations are really interesting because if the person believes in what it is that you're saying, then it sells away what it is that you're doing. And one question that I always get asked, and it's not off topic, it's a very good topic for this subject. Um, I always get asked all sorts of, I always get asked all sorts of questions. And if you're not prepared to answer those questions, the problem is that you, you can, your performance can collapse faster than if they don't believe you during the performance. So I always have a series of of these explanations and pseudo explanations, and it changes and it's malleable depending on who it is that I'm talking to. So, you know, if I meet somebody and somebody says to me, oh, you know, this must be intuition and it must be this, is this a gift you were born with, which is the one that I get the most? The answer to that question is, you know, no, this is not a gift that I were born with, but I've done it for so long now that this, you know, this has become second nature. So it's intuitive now. I don't think about doing it and I can't turn it off. And it is something that that plagues my everyday life. And I talk about the negative impact, which is something that no mentalist talks about. You know, the idea of imagine being sat across from somebody on a date and knowing that that person doesn't want to be there. You can just feel it, but you're too polite to say anything. So you just sit there as well. Or when people are lying to you and you know that they're lying to you, when it comes to Christmas, you have to put on a fake smile because they're bringing you Christmas presents. So you already know what's inside them before you've opened them. And so everybody sees this as a benefit. You know, it'd be great if I could use this to predict something like the lottery because I won't have to worry about this type of stuff. Do you know what I mean? And, and so I do like pseudo explanations. And I, I just think you've got to be careful what you say. So if you, you know, if you're going to sit there and say that you're a body language expert at 12 years old, it's going to be something that's very unbelievable. But I think that the difference is if you if you say you're learning it, that's okay. So imagine taking your mobile phone out, you're 12 years old, and I wish I'd have done this, but I were told that this wasn't the way to go about it. But imagine filming yourself at, say, 12 years old and saying, I'm studying body language, I'm very new to it. You know, I started out as a magician. Can I show you something I'm working on? And you really shyly get your way through the performance and you film it. And then at 14, 15 years old, you say, you know, I've been doing, and you film this, a couple of years I've been doing reading body language or however your approach is, whatever your pseudo explanation is. And you say, can I show you what I'm working on a little bit more confidently? Now, when you get to 17, 18 and you turn around and you say, oh, I'm an expert at reading body language. And they say, yeah, all right, kid. You say, oh, and you open your phone and show them a video of you learning this at 12 years old. Well, it's still a pseudo explanation, but how credible now is that pseudo explanation based on the evidence that you recorded all those years before? 
So I think sometimes these pseudo explanations are a really great thing to garnish over the top of your work. Just don't make them so unbelievable that the performance collapses under the weight of the pseudo explanation. So I hope that makes sense. I went to the VIP party last year. I remember you bought all the drinks and a bottle of whiskey for yourself. It was very kind of you. Blue Wicks, uh, you, you know, when, whenever we go to these um, these parties, I'm always, you know, I'm always up for a bit of fun. And whenever whenever I'm out, so I get offered so many drinks and I get offered so much that it gets to a point where I think to myself, do you know what, like, and we poked fun at it. We poked fun at it on the How to Read Minds trailer. We were like, oh, you know, I haven't bought a drink since 2015. The the truth is, you know, that people are always trying to buy me drinks. But if you ever see me at a bar, I'm the first. But even at lunch or even when we go out, I'm the first person to put my hand in my pocket. And I'll literally, you know, I literally pay for as much as I can. I don't. It's not because I like to give. It's just because I'm just a... Gen, genuinely nice person if you know i just if i have the money on me i don't mind buying drinks i don't mind having fun and i bought a bottle of whiskey because and i'll get to you in a second mike i bought a bottle of whiskey because i just didn't like queuing in the big queues at the bar how much leeway what leeway is there in the scripting could i make this my own yes 100 percent. the the methods uh some of them are physiological uh, some of them require only learning one sentence to make them work some of them only require one moment in performance now You've asked such a brilliant question because you hit upon what the problem is with a lot of propless mentalism. So people seem to think that I'm an advocate for propless mentalism. I'm going to say right now I'm not. I'm an advocate for whatever method works for the presentation. And I discussed this the other day, right? You know, let's take a senator or a peak or a switch or propless mentalism. They're all viable methods. But let's say we were doing a drawing duplication. And the idea is at the end of a drawing duplication to end up with two drawings side by side. Somebody says, oh, I prefer the center tear. Well, the problem is using a center tear in that performance means you don't have two drawings to show by side by side, and therefore the plot falls to pieces under the weight of the method. If I use propless mentalism, likewise, they've never made a drawing, and if I make a drawing, there's no drawing there to duplicate and show, and therefore that method doesn't really work. There's a difference between guessing a drawing somebody's thinking of and drawing duplication. And so the peak or the switch is the only thing that you can work with at this moment in time because those methods fit in line with the presentation. And so propless mentalism, because the method is and has to be the presentation, it makes it very difficult to make a compelling theatrical performance because the performance suffers based on the fact that the, the verbiage that's used all the way through it is the thing that makes that makes the machine move. You're seeing the cogs that are on display all the way through. Whereas if the method's so minimal and it only requires such a small amount, then you make up for it with the performance. And then it's all you. You can say and do whatever you want. You can keep it as long as you want or as short as you want. And these ideas, whilst a lot of them are propless, the idea was to really drastically reduce the amount of work needed to make these incredible effects come to fruition. So the honest answer is, you know, there's so much leeway for you to do whatever you want. It's, it's there for you to mold and make into your own character. And it's there for you to use for yourself. So you can get this stuff. You could change it however you want. I offer suggested presentations and the ways that I've used this. Some of them talk about the butterfly effect and going back and changing one thing in, in history and then coming backwards in the future, coming back to the future and seeing how everything has changed. Other effects are just really simple. It's just the feet that's there, the hypnosis. Some of them are metaphorical and some of them I tell a story. But it's up to you. You know, in this sort of stuff, you're the master of your own destiny. And I suggest and give you the tools, but it's really up to you how you want to do it. And if you already have a, a character this will this will work with, you know, you'll get a lot out of this. Likewise, if you don't have a character, this will help you get a character and then help you work with it as well. So there's a lot of leeway. Non-English performers can perform all the effects. Yes, because none of it's language dependent. This is not a progressive anagram or it's not something that requires the spectator to think in a certain way. It's just straightforward, direct. And if you can understand the English to learn it and then you don't have to translate it, just say whatever it is that I'm saying in the language that you're learning it in and it'll work the exact same. A lot of these are physiological methods. So I don't really call this propless mentalism or propless pseudo hypnosis. I actually call it psychomechanical. And the reason I call it psychomechanical is because these are like mechanical methods that are achieved psychologically. So, you know, some of them still require the, a mechanical process, but you've created it and it's invisible. There's, it's not reliant on the language. 
you know, it's just reliant on you being able to follow what you've seen and then doing it. But I stress, and I want to stress it again, practice this stuff and you'll get better and better at it. We're getting a lot of good questions. These are great. I hope everybody's enjoying it. I know we're going off on all sorts of questions here. I hope I'm answering these questions. They're really nice. Um, so, Yun, nice to talk with you. Effects can be done over Zoom calls. So the, the hand stick can certainly be done over Zoom. I also teach you a series of mentalism techniques you'd be able to do over Zoom. If you were to coach somebody with friction, I'm sure you could do friction over Zoom. You could quite easily make it look like you'd done sort of some sort of induction over Zoom. But the honest answer is that, like a lot of magic and mentalism, most of this stuff is a spectator sport. Just because some of it can be done over Zoom doesn't mean that it should be. I think what happens is you diminish the effect. And that's the important thing is, is you know, the answer is yes to some of it. Obviously, my das touch can't be done over Zoom. Um you know, obviously knock back induction can't be done over Zoom because you're knocking somebody back. You could do the hand stick, but you wouldn't be able to do the tri you would be able to do the tri version of over Zoom. So yes, you could do that over Zoom. Yes, you could do ambidextrous over Zoom. So yeah, good good percentage of it can be done over Zoom, but you'd have to translate it to work over Zoom. You'd have to put the work in. I haven't sat there and created these for Zoom. I, I created them for going out in the real world and using them. And if you've watched Craig Petty's video, one of the things that he said is Pete Turner's done this stuff for fucking years. But it's true, I have done it for years. And that will, you know, I've done it for years and years. And, and he's right. So I've, I've learned all the ways that you can do this. And I wouldn't recommend it for Zoom, but it is certainly possible over Zoom if you make the necessary tweaks and translations. Will the, the effects work every time you perform them or are there situations that spectators will cause problems for the performer? Magic 17, great, great question. The honest answer is that, let me tell you a story. So I, I were doing, so my das touch, I've had it fail on me twice in my entire performing career. So, well, I say my entire performing career, the time I've performed it, I performed my das touch for over 10 years. The first time it failed on somebody that I was dating at the time, and I asked afterwards, like, what went wrong? And she said, oh, I've seen you perform it on other people. So I were expecting to see multiple touches. So it failed there. And then I were doing a show, actually, with a show in London. And this is mentioned in the, the making of. Um, and that effect failed there. But what were beautiful about it, and hear me out here, because when I say fail, it didn't fail. What, what it allowed me to do was to segue perfectly into a secondary effect that's on the set and then get a really big reaction from it. So it doesn't fail out and out. But if so, it's like anything. Let's imagine you give a billet to a spectator and you say, write you something nice and neatly on there, and they give you it back and they've done this. If you peak that billet, it's no good to you. So you have to work a secondary method to make the first method work. If you ask somebody to pick a playing card and they pick it and put it back in the deck and lie about the card that they picked out, that effect's going to fail as well. And so all magic and mentalism as, an, as a 1% error of failure you know, if you're going through your invisible deck and the cards suddenly spread themselves because the roughing fluid or whatever it is that you've used to rough the card separates or heat can cause it to separate, that can fail as well. And so I asked the girl, like, oh, I tried, sorry, I tried to surmise afterwards why. And she has been to so many of these magic performances that what, she, what she'd expressed to somebody else and what I think she'd said it to somebody else and I thought at the time is that she was trying to hide the secret from me. And because she was trying to hide the secret, she didn't want to expose me. And so she was trying to help me, but inadvertently what she did is she ended up making the performance have to change. And that footage is going to be aired on the project. I'm not shying away from airing that footage. I'm going to show you what I did to get out of that situation, how seamlessly I moved into another effect. So the effects work every time if you follow the formula that I say, but there's a 1% chance that sometimes somebody's not going to listen with my dust touch. And that's happened twice over the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of performances that I've done. And that's only the same as asking somebody to write something down on a billet and some of them don't bother and some of them scribble. But every other effect on the set is physiological. So it has to work time and time again. The only time it'll fail is if somebody puts their fingers in their ears and starts humming and just ignores what it is that you're going to say to them. So to answer your question, yeah. Can you tell us more about mind games? Do you know what? I, I saw earlier on that Mark were tuning into this. I don't know if Mark Lemon's about. Are you on the, can I bring Mark Lemon in? Is he about? If he's not, it doesn't matter because it'd be great to jam backwards and forwards with Mark. Tea or coffee? We can invite him. Yeah, invite him on and we'll get to that when he comes on. Uh, tea for me normally. 
but I've, I've started really loving fruit teas. Fruit teas have become my favorite thing. Thank you for that question because that's a nice one as well. Um, here he is, Lemon Boy. Hello, how are you doing? Not too bad, mate. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, haven't like seen I, you in ages. I know, a whole week. I know. I was just, uh, I was just saying, I don't know how long you've been on the call, but I was just mentioning the jam session last week. Mm, it was so good. I got so much from it. Yeah, I learned so yeah. much. And That's what was, I was saying. You know, like yeah. I just, you, the pressure thing, the moving the pressure. I, I said afterwards, I, you know, I, I rang Fraser and I was like, God, it were most. It's annoying because it's one of those things I wish I'd have created, and I couldn't believe when you'd shared it. I was like, Are you sure you want that to go? And you're like, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so to, to, to let's talk about mind game. So we obviously mm. arrived in Spain via different modes of transport. You were there before me. Yeah, I, I had a much more comfortable journey. Yeah. And, well, that were it. And then uh, one night I jumped off the roof of the villa. We both jumped yeah. off the roof of the villa into the swimming pool, which we don't recommend. <laughs> and I actually like dive bombed and hit the bottom of the pool and I'd hurt my ankle. And so the next day I just wanted to relax and I wanted to chill. And we woke up in the morning. I said, look, let's start a little bit later because I just want to rest up for a little bit. And we put the camera down and we were like, let's just record a few bits and see what happens. And then we started talking. And then one hour turned into two hours and then we moved down into the pool and then that turned into an hour and then we moved to the side of the pool and then that turned into that. And then we were on our journey doing the Dice Man stuff. And every time we took a break, we just talked about psychological forces and, yeah. and psychological mentalism. Do you, you know, do you want to... Do you want to talk a little bit about it? And yeah, I'm, I mean, it it was it's basically a project on psychological forces, but I think that a lot of people are put off psychological forces because they're worried about what happens when it goes wrong. So that's kind of what we addressed over those several days, and and that whole project was um, how to make these things most surefire that you possibly can, but also how to give yourselves out and how to always have an effect and something that's going on. If this doesn't quite hit, you can move into something else or you can use it as a lead into something. And and the, the, the way that we've kind of moved them and, and changed them and re-engineered some of these psychological forces, um, they're gonna hit, they're gonna hit much more often than they ever have before. And, and there's so much stuff around it. And the idea is that with flowing and stuff you can just take little elements and move them into other things you can create your own psychological forces from this and and you can perform them with so much confidence because there's just backup after backup just some of the little touches that we were going over on on what to do you know when you're seeing this and oh wait a second no, you can answer that in a second mark because that's a good <laughs> one um um yeah, I was just I was just expressing that a second ago for the I mean you've seen the project for the well it was originally called Jedi, but the how to control mind stuff. You uh, right, okay. So this here's here's something. Over the last I don't know how many years, you must have seen me perform countless times. And you know that I'm the first first in social situations. And even in Spain, we had a crowd of people around the corner waiting with a hand like that to have me read them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But like out of all those times, like how many times have you ever seen me not bring something to a complete successful c conclusion with it with the hypno stuff? It's every time. I don't think about it. Not a really single time. Yeah, it's every time. It, it's it's just hit every time. There's been an incredible effect, an incredible reaction, and yeah, everybody's getting something out of it. It's it's just yeah. It's, I've been so impressed, like seeing you perform so much over that period of time, and just hitting it, hitting it, hitting it every single time. It's been That's amazing. It. And the Psy Forces, interestingly, I, I don't think we ever really had, a, even even in the bold versions, we never really had a miss of anything in the old, no, which nothing. is weird because statistically, statistically it suggests that you'd have to, but, you know, but just to go back to that other question, I know it's not related to mind games, but, you know, to what Mark answered it better than I could, we've created insurances for, for all this stuff, so you're never going to fail We've taught you the ways to get out of stuff. We've taught you the easy layback options. Mind games, we taught you a get out of jail free quote that's going to get you out of every situation you're ever going to yeah. be. And even if you fail, the worst you can ever fail. And so that should have given time, Mark, uh, Lee, for Mark to think about the favorite favorite time that he's. Uh... <laughs> I mean, one of one of the ones that springs to mind. So, Mark, share your favorite story of working with Peter on this project. I mean. The, the the dice man thing cropped up some 
some extremely funny situations for me and some but I, I guess one of the best was seeing you have to eat some snails at the restaurant which was amazing and I don't know yeah you were like I'll oh, pick some things from the menu and pick some random things and then roll the dice and it came up with a snail which obviously I was hoping it was going to come up for you probably would have preferred any of the other five options and uh, we ordered the portion and it wasn't just ordered the portion. It was okay. Now I'm gonna and I tried to get out of it, and I said I'm gonna roll the dice to see how many I have to eat. Do you remember that? And I rolled it <laughs> six. Yeah, and um, um, yeah, it was just hilarious for me to just see you eating them and look like you were gonna vomit at the table and running out of the restaurant. And I didn't follow you around the corner with the camera, but I could imagine what was going on around the back of that restaurant. So. It, it was rough. And on the trip, you know, we had all sorts come up. We got, we, and this will make it into the, you know, the book, and I won't say too much, but one night we were stood and somebody tried tried reaching into Mark's pocket and pickpocketing him. Yeah. You, you know. Like, yeah, I was holding the camera and I just felt a hand go into the back of my pocket. I dropped my hand down and I grabbed his wrist. <laughs> and then, yeah, we got into some, some I like filming out in Mallorca in in the in the resort we were there it was just nuts wasn't it getting pushed around people flashing themselves at us and lots of shouting and yeah it was crazy proper in the trenches and it's yeah and the and you were still hitting it nailing nailing those performances every time it was it was amazing yeah it was I, great. Th I, th I think my favorite story with you is so we we decided one night that we were gonna gonna keep filming we were just going to keep filming to see where it went. So we're rolling this dice. And because the dice had to decide on everything that we do, it's we wrote the names of the clubs down each time and rolled the dice. So we ended up going to these clubs and doing these performances. But it, when it were like we rolled the dice and it were like, right, now you have to drink 14 Jaeger bombs and then do this performance. And then it's like rolling it again and like now just approach a random person and, and we're getting cans of beer and we had to neck these cans. And as we as we progressively got further and further down the road using these dice rolls, like you just see it go from like, it were like that scene from, um, have you ever watched Wolf of Wall Street? Where yeah. like he, yeah. he, he, drives his, he drives his car home. And he gets in the house and he goes, oh, I can't believe I've got home so safely. And then like, the police knock on the door and say, have you been drink driving? He says, no, officer, I've not. And then they open the door and the car's just in this disheveled yeah. side. It was like my favourite day because we just went from being like real on form and we'd started at like 8 o'clock in the morning. And then once it gets past like 9 o'clock at night over in Spain, you can't buy anything but alcohol and kebabs, like greasy kebabs, that's all you can buy. Yeah. So it, it goes all the way down. And also, this was another favourite moment of mine, getting this tattoo here. That's, I don't know if you can see this on camera, but I got a tattoo here whilst I were out there. We rolled the dice for that. And you'll see what the reasoning was for the, the tattoo whilst I were out there. But that was such a good day as well. Yeah. Yeah, there were many, many highlights on the whole project. But I'm so proud of, yeah, of, of you, what you your performances what you've created and what you've given given up here like these are things you've been working on for a long long time and they've been really like routines and effects that have been so close to your heart and some of them guarded some of them nobody's heard of before some people have heard of before but now these are updated and 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 changed and improved and yeah it's it's been a real pleasure working with you on it and i'm so yeah, it's it's a great project. I'm so well, thank pleased. You. Thank it's, you for being a part yeah. of it. You know, I'm so so happy to have you. Right, this is it. So what we're going to do is we're gonna we're gonna I'm going to say bye to you, Mark. Thank you for coming on because you're. Oh, it's you know, great to see you, and thanks everybody for your support on the project. And um, yeah, nice to and see you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for coming in. Right, so we're back. So listen, I'm going to ask for one final question. This is the last question. I'm going to try to keep this brief, and then I'm going to make an important statement and then get out of here so we can all go and enjoy our day. So one final question. Team, pick a juicy, juicy question for me. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter who it's from. And then and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Can these effects on the set break apart when people talk to each other afterwards, like the double reality methods? So this is Jonas. Thank you for the, thank you for the question, Jonas. So this one I'm going to answer over the space of a couple of minutes because there's something that you've got to understand about dual reality. 
Uh, multiple realities is the appropriate term because dual reality, every single magic trick you ever perform is a dual reality effect technically. And the reason every single magic trick you ever perform is a, a dual reality is because what you know and what the spectator knows and thinks is happening is two different things. So that's dual. And so I always call it multiple reality. Uh, and even though the technical term is dual reality for every, the audience seeing one thing, the spectator seeing another. Dual reality, bad dual reality is bad dual reality. And bad dual reality is something that is very simple to fix more often than not. And what you want to do is you want to create blurred reality. And blurred reality is the line between reality and dual reality. And if you create a blurred reality and you cover your back, then it's an effect's only strengthened when somebody talks about it. So the answer to your question is no. The only effect on the set that's really dual reality or dual reality based, maybe there's two of them, is uh, Robin Hood and Midas Touch. Now, the true brilliance of the makeup of Midas Touch, and think about this, listen to what I'm saying, because it's a really important way to understand the way that I think about the routines. When you watch a regular effect, or when you perform a regular effect, the performer's experiencing something, and the audience are uh, uh, witnessing the participant or spectator experience something. The audience, more often than not, are really not experiencing it. They're not. The true beauty of PK touches or Midas touch is that the spectator's got their eyes closed and it's the entire audience as a mass that are experiencing something. And what, what's so brilliant about that is let's take a regular effect and then compare it to Midas touch. Let's say, for example, I'm performing something on a spectator and the audience are witnessing the spectator experience this effect. And they notice a piece of sleight of hand that I'm using when it goes back in. When they turn around to everybody and go, I saw the sleight of hand there. I saw this. You've now got the entire audience and the spectator arguing with you about the fact that you use sleight of hand. Well, when my dad's touch, the spectator's got their eyes closed. And when they say, no, no, I definitely felt him touch me when he came close to me. Or I definitely felt him touch me when he were here. Or he did something on my back. Or he touched my hair. Or he were pulling my legs across the carpet. Whatever it is that they're going to talk about afterwards. And the weirdest things are said. In that situation, in that situation, the spectator had their eyes closed and the entire audience on mass have witnessed something else. And it makes it a very special kind of effect because when the spectator says, no, he, he definitely touched me, the audience have not seen you touch them ever. So they go, no, he didn't touch you. He didn't go anywhere near you. He did. He, he was touching me. No, he wasn't. And the entire audience are the ones that are arguing in your favor against the spectator. And it's the only time, the only time out of all effects, one of the anomalies, that the more the spectator talks about, the more impossible and impressive it gets to the audience because they're the ones that are arguing your case. It's not the audience and the spectator against you. It's the spectator arguing to get against them. You're taken out of the equation. And it's a very, very specific, special anomaly, the way that it's created, when you think about it, the formula of the way that it's built. If the audience talk about any of the other effects, I've created them in such a way that they sit on that blurred reality line. So, you know, let's say that it's Robin Hood. Afterwards, when they talk, it only strengthens the effect because I've tried to create the same formula that happened in PK Touches or Midas Touch as I have in... in um, Robin Hood. So the entire audience have seen one thing and are arguing against the one person that's saying something's happened. So I'm going to finish on this story for you, Jonas Gloop, because I think you'll really get something out of this story. And it's about a hypnotist. And a hypnotist at a show is really failing. Nobody's going under. He's struggling to get anybody to listen to what it is that he's saying. And he has one person left on the stage and he says, just close your eyes for me. So the person closes their eyes and he leans in and whispers and says, Listen, mate, I'll pay you 50 pounds if you play along. I'll pay you 50 pounds if you do everything that I ask, not if you're going to do it for me. And the guy's got his eyes closed and they nod. And he leans back. And he has this person doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things because this person is just playing along. And then it comes to the end of the show and he says, when I snap my fingers, you'll close your eyes. Snap. The person closes their eyes and he goes to the audience. In a moment, I'm going to wake Steve up. And when I wake Steve up, he's going to be convinced that I offered him £50 to play along tonight. He's going to be convinced that I said I'd give him £50 if he did everything that I said. And then Steve opens his eyes and goes, you did say you'd give me £50. And now the entire audience roll with laughter 
And they're the ones that are saying to the person, hi, ah, still under hypnosis. And the more people that Steve tells that you were offered £50, the more people believe you're under hypnosis. The hypnotist doesn't have to give him £50 and the show's a raging success. And the formula there, so that uh, that was, it wasn't it wasn't originally Paul Zenon. It's older than Paul Zenon, but Paul Zenon was the person that popularised that. So you're right, it was Paul Zenon who did it, who filmed it. It was from a very old book. I think maybe even older than Norman McGill. I don't know. But... Paul, Paul Zenon, absolute inspiration for me. He's such an incredible guy. I used to watch his VHS tapes when I was younger. But the moral of that story is this, is that if you frame your effects up in a certain way and you don't have to offer people money, you don't have to ask them to play along or be a stooge, you don't have to do any of that. If you learn how to frame your effects up and you spend as much time as I do focusing on the choreography and the way that an effect plays out and understanding the way that directors use specific moments in film and artists in studios use specific sounds to create these incredible things that really rock us to our core. You'll understand that I've taken those same inspirations and framed them up in this so that when they talk afterwards, it doesn't matter what they say, they can't ever break down what this is because there's nothing to break down its words. You can't show somebody something that doesn't exist. If you can't see it, they can't see it. You could try explain it and they can go backwards and forwards, but ultimately they're not versing me, they're versing the audience. And the audience have to go against what they've witnessed with their own eyes, which makes these effects unbreakable, you know? So it's a good question. It's a great place to end. I want to just, can I talk pig, about pig cakes height before you go? I don't know if this is a joke. I don't know. They're juicy. Pig cakes height, juicy. So I, I actually hypnotized pig cake in Miami to believe that it was six foot three. And for the last year, he's abused me. There is nothing, Mike. Um, Pig Cake has actually abused me for the last six months because now he says I'm taller than you and I can bully you whenever I want. And so for the last six months, I've suffered at the hands of that evil man. Um, but no, in, in all seriousness, you know, he he's just a great little person. Do you know what I mean? He's such a, such a good, good guy. And I, I really, I love hanging out with him. We chat on, on a daily basis and he's, he's always, a, he's attacking me for how tall I am. And he says, he's going to get a step, step ladder next time he sees me and he's going to beat the living bejeebas at me. Uh, I think that's an American word. I don't know what it means, but, but yeah, so I want to, I do want to finish on a serious note and it's this is listen, when I, I went to a car boot sale when I was about seven or eight years old, and that's a flea market for people in America. And I saw Paul Daniel's magic set, and it was £2.50, and I couldn't afford it. And I went home, and I begged my nan, because I live with my grandma, I begged my nan for £2.50. And she said, listen, you'll work for it. So I spent the next two weeks working and hoping that this magic set were going to be there. And I went back, and it was there, and I picked it up, and I had the best time in my life learning these Paul Daniels effects. And and even though the kit were for beginners, what I'd done is taken it apart and give it my my own presentations, my own touches. Even at seven years old, I mean I'd been in magic at that, you know, that that age for about four years. I uh I again one of the milestones in in my dreams were to one day have my own kit and my own set. And how to read minds are a big, big part of how to read minds but it were already something that were going into production before I joined the company. This is my first set that's a, not a solo endeavor, but it were dreamed up and cooked up by me. And I just can't believe that finally it's here. And I can't believe that this day has come. It's, you know, it's taken a long, long time, but it's finally here. And I just want to thank you guys for investing the money into this kit. It's so amazing to think that people around the world are backing this kit. It's so amazing to think that people are putting money into it. And what scares me the most, and, and not scares me in a bad way, it's almost like a like a roller coaster ride, is to think that there's going to be people around the world going out and doing this stuff. And in some way, you know, it, it's helped me bring everything full circle. So for all those people that have backed the kit, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I did say this on the project, you know, it's a dream come true for me. And for those people that have not backed it or if you're on the fence about backing it, listen, you know, you can take this for what it's worth. This is the kit that I always wished that I'd had. If I could have looked at any kit and excelled myself forwards X amount of years, this had been the kit that I'd have wanted. Do you know what I mean? And that's the sort of way that I've looked at it. And that's and I, and 
I gain nothing more from you getting this. I don't get paid any extra if you get it. So it doesn't matter to me if you buy it or you don't. So you could take that for what it's worth when I'm telling you whether to get it or not. But yeah, so thank you for coming to the Ask Me Anything. Thank you for sharing your questions and sharing, you know, this, this whole thing. It's just such an incredible thing. And with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll call it a draw.